little bit late, but we're back up at half power. We're limping along. Um, let's see. Is that one on? That other screen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's just blue. Yeah. Okay. Well, you'll just use that as a nice backdrop to our class. Okay, so we talked about the differences. So what's the difference between renaming and substitution? In the expression to which it belongs? What? Replace what? Free variables, yes. So that's one of the keys, right? Substitution only changes free variables, right? Whereas the renaming operator just renames everything, right? What's another important difference between the two? Sub substitution, uh, would, okay, with substitution, you're guaranteed to have the same uh, what do you call it? The same expression because it just takes away the, it takes away a layer of abstraction. Ooh, almost. That's what we're gonna, That's actually what we're going to use the substitution operator for, okay. and that's what we went over the last at the end of class on Monday. Is our show move back? Right. So that's what the substitution operator will be used for, right? But fundamentally, it replaces IDs with what? That's the other key difference. What does it replace IDs with? Values. Or substitution replaces IDs with uh, another lambda expression. Right? Expressions, right? With renaming is just renaming one ID to another ID, right? So we can't rename an ID to an arbitrary expression. That's why we have the substitution operator. Okay, so we went through some trick, or we went through some applications of this, right? So the substitution operator is the brackets, and we're having x, and we're replacing x with the lambda expression 2. And remember, we're replacing all three x's with the lambda expression 2. Which means that when we see something like this, right, when we're trying to do the substitution operator to substitute x for the lambda expression 2 in the lambda expression lambda x dot plus x1, is this going to change anything? No, right? Because is this x free? No, this is a bound x, right? So our substitution operator is not going to change that. OK, we saw the other pitfall that can happen, right? What happens if we're trying to substitute? A so what's going to happen here? not going to be free when it's put back in. Yeah, so we want to keep the semantics, right, of what we're substituting in there, right? So if x is free here, but the substitution would cause x to be bound, that's changing what we're actually substituting in there, right? So if we change it with something like this, well, now this x refers to the bound x and not the free x, right? Inside this lambda expression that we're substituting, this x is free which means after we do our substitution, x should also be free. So what can we do? Are we just, we just have to give up in this case? No. What do we do? Wait, did you say yeah? Would we have to use renaming on the original expression to change? To the rename what? To what? The x in the original expression into basically anything else. Yeah, so as long as we rename, right, this x is bound in the original expression. So if we just rename this x to whatever we want, w, y, or not y, uh, not y, right? Just a new variable that doesn't, a new ID that doesn't appear in either one. Now we can do the substitution, and now we have something that's semantically the same, right? This is functionally equivalent. The lambda y, lambda w dot y w is semantically equivalent to lambda x dot y x. So we can actually do the substitution. So does that make sense? Questions on the substitution operator? The intuition behind it? Yeah? Is it best to change the original expression or the free variable that needs to remain free during the loop? Uh, so if we change this x to a w, would this change what this expression does? Yes. Would that be a functionally equivalent change? No. Yes? The w? Just change that x. What does this x refer to? A variable. A, 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 a 
a free variable. We don't know what it does, but it could refer to something else. I mean, we don't we don't actually know the whole context of this app. We're just focused here on these things, right? So if I change this x to a w, right, it's a free variable, but now it refers to something else, right? You can think we've changed the programmer's intention because we're changing global variables. Exactly. This x refers to some global free x. This x specifically refers to this x in the lambda in the uh, meta variable x. This is a bound x and it's bound to that x in that lambda abstraction. So it's specifically why we don't want to rename the, the free x in the substitution. Okay, so what does the substitution operator, so formally, how are we going to define the substitution operator? So we're saying, once again, right, we have e, some expression, we're going to replace x in that expression with a new lambda expression n, right? And once again, we're talking about free variables, right? So we want to go through all the cases that a lambda expression could possibly be in, and we want to understand what could those values be, right? So we're basically breaking an expression down into all the different cases. So in the case that e is actually x, then what's our substitution going to be? So if this e was just an x. Then it would just be an n? Yeah, just an n, right? We're replacing x with n. So if the expression is in the form of the exact id that we're looking for, then we just simply replace it. Right, so that handles one case. What's the other case that's similar to this? So what's the case? So this is the case that what? The expression is what type of a lambda expression? An ID, and what's specifically the condition on that ID? It is free, yes. Actually, we're just looking at one ID. It's going, the ID is always going to be free because we're just looking at one expression, right? So what's specifically important about this ID in this case? That it is X. Yeah, that it's X, right? That it's actually X. Right, so what's the opposite case there? Where it's not x. Where it's not x, happen. right? We need to handle the case of what happens if this id is not x. Let's say it's y, right? Well, then we know the operator doesn't do anything, right? It doesn't change y because it's only changing ids with the same id as x. Make sense? Mm -hmm. And we can see that there's no other possibilities that could possibly happen here between ids. An id is either going to be equal to x or it will be not equal to x, right? So you co should convince yourself that that handles all the cases there. Okay, what about function application? What do we do on function application? So let's say e is a function application. So we have E, we want to apply the substitution operator on E, and we have E is actually E1 space E2. So you would just do the substitution operator on E1 and E2? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, substitute, right? So we distribute the substitution operator to both expressions, right? We do an expression one and expression two. Right, there's nothing special there about application here. Now the case comes in, now we have to think about what's the third type of an expression? So we've done IDs, we've done application. Ex uh, abstraction, right? Yeah, a lambda expression or abstraction, right? So what happens, let's go did. What happens if we have lambda x dot e1 and we're trying to apply x substituted with some expression n. What would we do here? What's the result here? We would first have to rename the x because we aren't allowed to replace the bound variables because it's We don't one. want to replace the bound variables, right? Mm -hmm. So do we want to rename x? We would want to rename x within the expression so it goes from lambda x to like lambda w. Um, let me think about that. 
we would want to get rid of the lambda x and replace all the x's in the expression with n. Yes, okay, we do want to replace all, what, what types of x's do we want to replace in, in this expression? Right, so this is our whole expression e, right? This is our whole thing e. Think about this, is, are there going to be any free x variables inside e1? Why not? Because they're all going to be bound to the x. Yeah, any x in E1, no matter where it is, is going to be bound either to this lambda x or any other lambda x. So it's actually not possible for there to be a free variable with the name x inside E1. So then do we even need to do this operator inside E1? No, we just say it's lambda x dot E1. Right? So we don't actually need to go in there. So you can kind of think about it, the abstraction kind of protects the substitution operator from going in further into the body. Uh, but the reason all has to go back to free variables and bound variables, right? We just kind of prove to ourselves that E1 cannot contain any free x's. Therefore, it doesn't make sense. We can't substitute anything in there, so we stop. Okay. So then what are the other cases? So we have, let's say, what was our other case before? So we had the ID here. So the important thing here was that the IDs were the same, right? In this case? So what's the other case? They aren't the same. They aren't the same, yes. Look at this. You guys are so good at logic. All those years of computer science. Now, <coughs> so can I just then say, well, this is the same thing as lambda y dot e1 applied to the substitution operator? Yes? Well, what was the problem that we talked about? What problem can happen here when we try to do the substitution? What do we have to look out for? If n has y in it? If n has y in it. Yeah, so we, but specifically, do we care about does, if n has a bound y, do we care? No. It's a free y. It's a free y. Yeah. So actually, we're break, we have to break this case down into three different cases. So either it's going to be x, the meta variable is going to be x, or it's going to be not x. That's the second case. That case is broken down into uh, if, uh, let's say free y does not exist in n. I'm kind of abusing notation here, but. I have it more formally defined on the on the actual page, right? So if the case that y is free, sorry, is not free in n, then we can just do the substitution operator, right? We can just pass it through. And we know this is not going to cause any problems, right? Because we know when we do the substitution, it's going to be fine here for this y. So what about the case where if there is a free y, what if that exists in n? Then what should we do? Yeah, so we would need to, exactly. Uh, we're basically going to replace, we need to replace this. We want to do lambda w dot e1, and we're also going to need to replace all free y's in here with w's, um, and then do the substitution operator of x goes to n. But let's look at how we normally define that. Okay, we've done all these rules. So we've seen the lambda x case. If it's y, Right? So we say that we do the substitution operator, we pass it inside of the body of an abstraction. If y is not, the meta variable is not the same as the substitution variable that we're interested in, and y is not a free variable in n. Right? So the other idea is okay, let's rename it to some new variable y prime where we say it's a fresh variable name, so it appears neither in E or N, right? It's a new variable name. Can we always come up with a new variable name? Yeah. yeah. Whatever, add a prime. Now, whatever crazy method you want to use. Take the longest variable name in E and N and add an A to it. That would be one way to do it, right? And so we're inside E, we're going to replace Y with Y prime. And this way, this ensures that now 
all of those variables are going to be changed. So that those bound variables. So the thing to worry about here, what kind of operator are we using in here to substitute y for y prime? Is that what the renaming operator, right? But I said the renaming operator was very simple and just it's going to change every instance of y to y prime. But if we change a free y from y to y prime, is that going to change the semantics of this method of, of the, uh, sorry, of the expression e? So every single instance of y in e is going to be bound at least to this meta variable, right? And the substitution operator means even if there's other abstractions of <coughs> lambda y, right, we're going to change those also to be y prime. And we're changing bound variable <coughs> names, so we're not going to have any problem. Okay, does this make sense? Questions on this? Very important component. This is the key behind actually doing function applications. This is the core crux of the operator. OK. Let's look through some examples. So here, if we have lambda x dot x and we want to replace x with foo, what's the result going to be? What was it? Lambda x dot x. Lambda x dot x, yeah, right? Because the x is the same as the meta variable, which means we're not going to go into that expression. Great. OK, plus 1x replace, I'm not going to do this, we've done this 100 times, <laughs> right? So the question is, how would you actually do this? Well, you would use the, I don't remember the number third rule, I think. You would distribute this operator to each of the plus, the 1, and the 2, uh, the plus, the 1, and the x. And then you would apply each of those operators, and you would see that that x would then be replaced with 2. So now if I have the case of lambda x dot y is x, and I'm replacing y with lambda z dot x z, now what's going to happen here? Which of my cases is going to hold? Change the bound x name. Change the bound x name in which one? Here on the left or the right? There's a e or n? There's only one bound x. E. There's on only e. one. Yeah, there's only one. I just want We're being very clear. Um, so we want to change the bound x to, let's say, w. right? And why do we need to change that? <coughs> the global x might reference something else. Yeah, the global x in the thing that we're substituting, right? That x. If we just substitute that, because there's a free x in what we're substituting, we have to change. So we say, OK, the last rule applies. We have lambda w dot wx applied first, the renaming operator to rename all x's to w's, and then the substitution operator of substituting y's for lambda z dot xz. So we'll do the substitution operator. It will give us back y w, and then we apply or sorry, the renaming operator will give us yw, and then we apply the substitution operator, we distribute it, and we finally get lambda w dot lambda z dot xz w. Okay, what if we have something more complicated? Well, is it more complicated? I don't know. So we have this lambda expression x applied to lambda y dot xy substituting x for yz. So what's the top level app, uh, top level expression here? It's a free variable in that abstraction. Yeah, so we have we're going to distribute our substitution operator to the x and then also to the lambda, the abstraction. Exactly. So we'll do the first one, the left one. So this is x. So we're replacing x with yz. Then we look here, right? And we say, oh, we're replacing y. y is not the same thing as x. But there is a free y in what we're substituting, right? So we have to change every y's here to something else. So we can change them to q's. 
doesn't matter what. So we change all y's to q's, and then we do the substitution operator, we do the distribution again, and then we replace the x finally with yz. Questions on this? It's pretty straightforward. Okay. Now, I kind of made the promise when we started lambda calculus, right, that you could be able to use this to execute and do computations, right, to perform some kind of arbitrary computations. So what do we mean by execution? I mean, when you talk about Turing machines, what do you mean that a machine kind of executes? Starts executing a process, and then what happens? So we start executing it, then what happens? Follows instructions. What was that? Follows instructions. Yeah, follows each instruction until what? <laughs> jump to a different address to true. Yeah, or it accepts or rejects or halts, right? At some point it has to like stop computing so you know that the execution is done. Okay, but here we don't have processes, we don't have addresses, we don't have the concepts of halting. We're not even actually talking about a machine. All we have is functions, right? So we have to define some kind of notion of execution. So the idea is execution is gonna be a sequence of terms that's going to be the result of calling or invoking functions. So we're gonna say that by invoking functions, we will get a sequence of execution, right? So by applying this function, we'll get a new lambda expression, and then there we can invoke another, another function which will give us a new lambda expression, and we can keep doing that. And that will be what we'll consider execution. So every step in the sequence is going to be called a beta reduction. So we're going to reduce here is a little bit of a misnomer. There's no guarantee that the functions are actually going to get smaller. Right? They could actually get bigger. Um, but for the purpose of this, we call uh, a beta reduction. So key thing is when can we perform a beta reduction? Basically when we have expressions in the application form. So what does the application form mean? Expression, space, expression. <coughs> yeah, expression, space, expression. Right? Yeah, exactly. So. Right, when we have something that looks like this, well, specifically though, we need a lambda expression on the left and some arbitrary expression on the right. So if you think about this, the way we've, I've kind of tried to pitch this to you, right, lambda expressions, abstractions are functions. The body functions, right, they take in one parameter, their function, and applications are calling that function. So this means call this function, whatever it is, using n as the parameter for that meta variable. So you can only do beta reductions if you have something in this form, where you have lambda x dot e, some kind of expression. Uh, so it has to be an application form, and the left has to be a lambda expression. So. We're going to define this using the substitution. This is why we spent a long time talking about the substitution operator. Because we're defining this based on the substitution operator. So based on our intuition, right, when we had that plus function, we wanted to find that function that added one to its argument. How are we going to use the substitution operator to do beta reduction here? So let's say you have something in this form, lambda x dot e space n. What does mean? What do you mean? It means letting you form um, like the function. You do whatever is in E, mm -hmm. but N is the um, parameter, mm -hmm. and X, like it. Perfect. Yeah. N is X. So then, how does that relate to the substitution operator? 
This just means, right, so that we want x to be n, so we want every instance of x in the body of E to be n. And so we're going to find this very simply as E su substituting x for n. Right, so we have to make sure we take care of all of the substitution rules, make sure that they make three variables in n, we properly rename those variables right, when we use them. This is why doing substitution is so key. And so this is one step. So applying the substitution operator gives us one execution step. And then we get the result of that is some new expression. And then we can see can we if there's anything in um, that is in a beta redux, right, an expression in this form, then we can apply it again, and we can do it again, and we can keep beta reducing. Uh, beta normal is a form, is an expression with no, when we can't apply any new beta reductions, right? There's nothing in the form of application, uh, application with the left being a lambda definition. Okay. And the main term, the key term we're going to use here, Full beta reduction this is what we're going to focus on. There's actually a lot of different ways of how to do execution here. Um, and actually, it's, well, yeah, we definitely don't have time to talk about it because there's other cool stuff I want to talk about. But it actually correlate with pass by value, pass by reference, pass by name, how you do that. So uh, you can actually do all of those different parameter passing types with lambda expressions, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, but we're going to talk about full beta reduction. So we're just going to keep doing beta reductions until we reach a state where there's nothing in this form. So can this be compared to like pass by name in a weird way? Yeah, you could kind of think of it like that. Well, let's but see. Think of like when you have, if you have a function with a parameter x and y, and then like when you call it, you go into the function and like change everything to x and y. Yes, kind of. I don't want to make a definitive answer because I don't know 100% for sure, so I don't want to say anything misleading. Um, it's also difficult because there are no variables. I mean, yeah. there's no, I, I talked about global variables, but there actually are no global variables. Um, so let's look at some examples, and then we'll look at, we're going to get into how we can actually do Boolean logic with this. So we can do ands, ors, nots, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we can actually build up multiple, um, addition and multiplication, which is pretty cool. Okay, so some examples here. So we have lambda x dot x, y. The first question is, can we beta reduce this? Yes, we can beta reduce this, right? We have an application, we have lambda on the left, and anything on the right. <coughs> so using this operator, right? So we have x, we have our e, and we have our n. So then what's the resulting substitution operator here? X, and what happens to X? It goes to X. Y. Yeah, X goes to Y. So we have X, and we're substituting X for Y. This is actually one of our rules. So we just simply replace X <coughs> with Y. Right? So this is one step of our beta reduction. Can we reduce this any further? Can we reduce Y any further? Yeah, there's no application. And the left side of the application has to be a lambda. Okay, let's look at something a little more complicated. Okay, so here I have lambda x dot x applied to lambda x dot x. And I'm passing, I'm calling it with the expression u applied to r. So can I beta reduce this thing? It's an application, the ur. Why not? You're shaking your head. No lambda. No lambda on the left, right? The left thing is just u. Can I, there is also an application inside here, right? We have x applied to lambda x dot x. Can I reduce that? The body of the outer abstraction, can I beta reduce this guy? Yes. Yes? How would you do that? Ah, the body of lambda x, so inside here. Not on the left side. Cool. There is 
there's only one, right? There is a, the top level, we have on the left a lambda, we have lambda x. Here, we have a lambda, and here we have ur. So then what are we gonna do? Place the second x that appears with ur. Place this second x? No, the second one that appears in the entire expression. Okay, this x with ur. So right, but we can take it very mechanically, right? We actually don't have to think. That's why we have computers. They do stupid things for us, right? So we can take the body of this lambda expression, and we're going to substitute x for ur, right? When we do a beta reduction, this is exactly what we mean. Now this essentially says replace every free x with ur. So is it going to touch anything inside this lambda expression? No. So the result here is going to be ur space lambda x dot x. Can we reduce this any further? Can we? No, right? you can't do anything with this. Look at this. Now do we have a choice of what to beta reduce? Can I reduce the ZZ here? No, no lambdas on the left. Can I reduce this guy? Yes. Yes, this is an application. There's lambdas on the left. What about the whole outer thing? Can I do this? <coughs> yes. Easier. Probably not going to be easier. Actually, look at it. It may actually be. So it's just going to turn left. So let's look, right? So actually, uh, there is, I think this actually may get more into call by value, uh, call by reference, or pass by value, pass by reference, the order that you do these applications in. What we're going to look at, the application order doesn't matter. We're just going to apply one of the reductions. So let's say we do the middle one first, or the one inside here, right? So we're going to replace w dot w with z in here. So we're going to have zz, and we're going to substitute in z for lambda w dot w. When we do this, now we have lambda w dot w space lambda w dot w. So now can I beta, beta reduce this guy again? Yes. Yeah, right, I can reduce that. It's going to be w, replace w with lambda w dot w. Finally, I get lambda w dot w. Now I can apply this here. So what happens when I do this? It's just y because there's no x. Right. There is no x inside the body here. So I'm replacing y with x. I'm substituting inside y x with lambda w dot w, which is just y. Right. So there we see if I had done the outer one first, I would have got to y in one step, as opposed to six steps, however long this took me. What about something like this? Lambda x dot x x applied to lambda x dot x x. How many choices do I have? Of what to beta reduce? One. One. I only have one choice. So let's do it. So inside the body here, right, are there any free x's in here? Do I need to worry about that? On the right, so we call the right one what if it has no, if it's a lambda expression with no free variables? Combinator. Combinator, right? Yeah, so there's no free variables, so we don't have to worry about any variable rename. Right, so when we do this, we're going to substitute x with lambda x dot x x, and we're going to get lambda x dot x x applied to lambda x dot x x. Can we do, can we beta reduce this? Sure, that's how you're going, right? Can we get this? It's going to keep going forever. So what did we get into? An infinite loop. Yeah. You can write infinite loops in Turing machines and your code, right? You can write an infinite loop in lambda calculus as well, right? You can never fully beta reduce this. It's going to keep going forever. OK. Oh. I want to get into, wow. All right, we need to get into Boolean logic today so that we can have that so that we can 
cover. There's other super cool stuff. The big thing that you should be wondering about is, uh, so we saw we can do kind of loops like this, but how do we do recursion when we have functions that have no names? Right? Normally in a function, you have that function call itself because it has a name. Right? You call it, define a function foo. You can recursively call that function by calling foo. Right? But the question is, here we have no names. We cannot name these, these expressions. So how do we get recursion out of that? So let's look first at Boolean logic. Does lambda calculus have a true or a false value? Would false be an infinite loop? No. Uh, infinite, that's a program, right? That's like saying false would be like a program that loops forever. The no, right? We didn't define anything like that. So we have to actually define true, what is true and what is false using lambda calculus. And these are going to be expressions. So they're going to look kind of weird. And so did I just, what you should think, is did I just lie to you by telling you we can't name expressions here? So I'm going to find true as lambda x dot lambda y dot x. question is, is it arbitrary? Uh, in some sense, yes, it is arbitrary. But you have to, once you, you have to define what you define as true and what you define as false. And depending on how you do that, that influences your operators, your and, your ors, your nots. Right? But let's go back to, did, did I, am I lying to you by giving this a name? No. no. It's just for us. Right, it's just for us. This is a shorthand for us as humans. Did I reference t inside of this expression? No. But with this definition, right, I'm defining t as this lambda expression. So this means every time you see t, you can replace it with this full thing. And it's not going to change anything. It's going to be exactly the same. So we're not introducing variables and variable names into the language. We're using this for ourselves. So what is this? What is this true? So what I talk about with currying, when we talk about currying, if you think about this like a normal function, how many parameters does this take in? Two. Two parameters, and what does it return? One. The first parameter. Yeah, you can think of it like a function that takes in two parameters, x and y, and just returns the first parameter. False is going to be the same, but the opposite. It's going to take in two parameters, and it's going to return the second parameter, y. Exactly. So <coughs> using this, we can actually write Boolean functions. So what properties should the function and have? How many parameters should it take in? Two. Two, two parameters. And what should it return? True. Either true or false. One of the two, right? We don't, depending on the inputs, right? And it should take in also either true or false, right? We can't pass in arbitrary values into an and function. I mean, we can't say and the string atom with the integer 20. That's meaningless, right? So we're going to define the and function in actually a super clever way. And I'm saying this because I clearly did not come up with this. <laughs> So what, okay, let's go back to basic logic. What do we want out of an AND function? If both of the parameters given are true, then it returns true. Yes, only if both the parameters are true should it return true. Right? If either of the parameters are false, what should it return? False. False. So we're actually going to use these properties. So keep in mind these properties. True always returns its first parameter. False always returns its second parameter. So we're going to find and as a function that takes in two parameters, a and b. And the body is a, d, f. So let's think about that. So let's think about the different cases. And just think about it. We don't have to, we're going to dig into the lambda calculus and do all the beta reductions. So if a is false, what's going to be returned here? Okay, let me check the. All right, there's a 